Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Bokel. Today we're going to talk about NOx emissions. Okay. All right, it worked a minute ago and now it's not working. All right. I've uploaded three files to your school's learning management system. This presentation is the first one. The second one we won't go over today in class, but you'll probably need to use it to do the third one, which is the homework for this session. The homework's due a week from today, and you should mail your results to me. You'll see there are two parts to it. First part, you're going to make some pretty easy conversions, and the second part is to take a little bit more work but again, you'll use the files there to help you do that. And obviously, if you have any questions, just uh, send me a note. Our learning objectives for today, after this session, you should be able to list the three primary mechanisms for NOx formation, and you should be able to discuss some general burner strategies for reducing NOx. We're going to spend most of our time on the second part of, that, of those objectives, mostly on what do we do to design burners differently to reduce that pollutant. So first of all, let's talk about NOx types and importance. Then we'll talk about NOx formation, spend a little bit of time on NOx measurement and reporting, and most of our time on NOx control. There are multiple forms of NOx, but in combustion there are really only two of them that are important. I'm going to talk about three of them, but really one of them is only, has only been measured in very small quantities. The most important one is nitric oxide, or NO. In most process heaters, for example, it's believed that about 90% of what comes out of the stack is in the form of NO. The second one that's important is nitrogen dioxide, and usually that's only on the order of 5 to 10% of the NOx that's generated. <laughs> But this one's important because the regulations often require you to report all of your NOx as NO2. The reason for that is NO, when it gets into the environment, after a few days it normally converts to NO2. So the regulators make you report it that way even though that's not actually what came out of the stack. The third one has been measured in really small quantities in laboratory flames. It's called N2O, laughing gas and it's been measured in parts per billion. Now the reason why I'm listing it here is it is a greenhouse gas, it's actually a fairly bad greenhouse gas, but it's in very very small quantities. So at least at the moment I've not seen any data that reported this for industrial flames, but it has been reported for laboratory type flames. And NOx is a bad thing in combustion but actually NO or nitric oxide is a good thing in some ways. It was actually voted to be the 1992 molecule of the year and for guys in particular you'll see that it's pretty important for us and you can actually buy it in pills. So just get this from Amazon this hasn't been opened so I haven't used it but you can use it if you want to so it is actually a good thing for physiology but it's a pollutant for NOx. So if we look at typical NOx emissions, again, most of it is in the form of NO. The balance is in the form of NO2. Gas firing generally makes less NOx than oil firing. If you don't have technology to reduce pollution, we sometimes refer to this as conventional technology, older technology, you can make NOx on the order of 100 to 150 ppm. That wouldn't be acceptable for many applications today, but in some countries that are using older technology, that would be a, com a common number or typical range for them. Oil firing usually has more NOx, it usually generates more NOx, and the reason is oil often has organically bound nitrogen as part of it. 
and that organically bound nitrogen, so it's not N2, it's N combined with some kind of hydrocarbon, that N breaks off very easily to make NOx. So when we make guarantees, for example, on an oil-fired system, we have to know how much organically bound nitrogen do they have. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but in general, oil firing usually makes more NOx. We talked earlier in the course about in the United States, lots and lots of folks fired oil 40, 50 years ago, but today very few people fire that for industrial processes because it makes too much pollution. And it's too expensive to clean it up. It's cheaper to fire a gaseous fuel than an oil because, again, the cleanup costs are too high. And part of that cleanup cost is more NOx. So why is NOx important? Well, there are lots of things that are bad about it. One is it inhibits respiratory function, damages vegetation, plays an important role in acid rain. When you have water in the atmosphere, it can react with NOx and make nitric acid. So that's not good. It can generate or participate in making ozone, photochemical smog causes eye irritation, visibility reduction, and N2O is a depleter of the good ozone in the upper atmosphere. So lots of bad things about it, which is why in many places, especially in the United States, it's very heavily regulated. Some of the toughest regulations in the world, probably the toughest regulations for NOx in the world are in California. In Texas, they're also fairly tough, not quite as tough as California. But in other places in Europe, let's say in Germany, in, in France, and Britain, they're also per fairly stringent. So let's talk just briefly about how NOx forms. The regulators honestly don't care how it's formed. They just want to know how much is coming out. But if we understand a little bit how it forms, then obviously we can control it better by making some adjustments. So NOx emissions are due to oxidation of atmospheric nitrogen. That's the most common way. If you have organically bound nitrogen in your fuel, then that's a more complicated process than this, but most of the NOx is generally made by N2 and O2 at higher temperatures reacting to form some kind of NOx. By the way, there are more than three kinds of NOx. There are other ones, but those are the three that are important in combustion. And lots of different ways that NOx can form the first three are the most important for typical combustion processes. The other two are for more specialized processes, and we'll see that in a minute. Here's a table summarizing how NOx forms by the various mechanisms. So we'll just walk through this quickly. Fuel NOx is where you have, again, organically bound nitrogen as part of the fuel. An example might be ammonia, NH3. So N comes off very easily not like N2. N2 is a very stable molecule. It's got a triple bond, not so easy to break, but other molecules, again, like ammonia, and ammonia is a fairly common component that you might see in a fuel system. It's not always initially in the fuel. It could be in the fuel because of other processes where it, it is added downstream. So again, in that case, easy to make that NOx, and in the case of oil, we need to know how much of the fuel has organically bound nitrogen in it because that will directly affect how much NOx is going to be made. Thermal NOx is the one we're going to spend most of our time on today. That one is a temperature driven effect and that's why it's called thermal NOx. It was discovered by a Russian scientist named Zeldovich back in the 50s. So you'll sometimes hear it called the Zeldovich mechanism. It's actually fairly simple in terms of the reactions. This is known as the extended Zeldovich mechanism. The first two, if you don't add the third one, then that's just the normal Zeldovich mechanism. So anything that causes the temperature to go up is usually going to be bad for thermal NOx. The third one, prompt NOx, is a very complicated reaction. It's called prompt NOx because it usually happens at the beginning of the flame. The good news is it doesn't usually contribute that much to NOx. It depends on the process, but roughly on the order of 5 to 10 percent of the NOx comes from prompt NOx. Today, though, we have reduced thermal NOx so much that now prompt NOx is becoming more and more important. 
So we're now going to have to start to look at what are some ways that we could reduce that. The N2O mechanism is only for high pressure flames. And in this course, we're only talking about basically atmospheric pressure flames. So that's not a mechanism for us. It would be, for example, in engines or turbines, but not in industrial combustion for the most part. And then the last one, NNH mechanism, that's for very high temperature flames, not the ones that we're talking about in this course. They are industrial flames. They would be, for example, when you use, replace combustion air with pure oxygen. So in a cutting torch, when you're using pure oxygen, you get very hot flames. So in that case, then, NNH would be important. For most gaseous flames, then, really the second and third are the only ones of significance. And again, we're going to talk a lot today about thermal NOx because we can control some things related to the temperature, and that will help us to reduce NOx. There are some operating parameters that have a significant impact on NOx. First one is furnace temperature. This is not something that we normally can control. It normally has to be a certain temperature. So the operators, the engineers can't go back to the plant and say, you know what, let's reduce the temperature of our furnace by 500 degrees. If they did that, they're not going to get their production. So the, the plant manager is not likely to let them do that. So it is fixed, generally speaking. But what we can say is that furnaces that run hotter than other ones are probably going to make more knocks. So as an example, in our industry, in process heaters, an ethylene furnace runs pretty hot. 2,000 degrees, 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, around there, as opposed to one that's on a, a platformer or a coker or some other ones that are going to be lower temperature. And that's because that's all they need to process what they're doing. So furnace temperature is a big one, except that, again, we don't really usually have much control over that. We usually can't adjust that. Excess air, we're going to see that when you have some excess air, that's going to be bad for NOx. The reason is that extra oxygen now is available to react with nitrogen to make NOx. Ideally, you'd write, like to run stoichiometrically so you don't have any extra O2 around, and then it won't be chemically favored to make NOx, except that in real combustion processes, we need some excess air. The problem for many of our customers is they run more than they need to. And that's really bad for two reasons. It's bad because they're heating up all that extra O2 and all the nitrogen that came in with it, so that reduces their efficiency. Well, when your efficiency goes down, then you have to fire more fuel, and of course that's making more NOx. Also, when you have that extra O2, that makes more NOx on a unit firing rate basis because, again, now you have extra O2 around to do that. So you really get penalized two ways when you have more excess air than you need. The reason they do that is their fuel composition varies so much, they want to make sure they always have enough. And we say, look, Mr. Customer, we understand that, but just don't go crazy. We, we visited some plants that their excess O2 was way too high. A good number is around 2 to 3%. We've been in plants where it's 7, 8, 9%. That's way more than it should be. So we try to tell them, look, we understand why you're doing this. Just don't go nuts. Don't have way more than you need, because if you do, you're getting penalized two ways for NOx, firing more fuel, and the fuel you are firing, you're making more NOx. Combustion air temperature, the third one, there are some processes that preheat the combustion air. They use the exhaust gases that are coming out to preheat the combustion air that's coming in. The reason they do that is for efficiency. Usually increases the efficiency on the order of about 10%. And 10% is significant when you fire as much fuel as they do. So that's the good aspect of it. Typically, they only do it on bigger heaters because the economics work better, but they could do it on any size heater. However, we're going to see later on that that's really bad for NOx, to the point that I heard a story one time about a company in Louisiana. They have a big plant. They obviously generate NOx when they're burning their, their fuels, and when they're going to have an ozone alert day, at least this is the way it used to be. I'm not sure if it still is because it's been a while since I heard this. But when they're going to have a, a bad ozone alert day, they'll, the 
government, the state government, will call this company and say, we want you to back off on your air preheat because tomorrow is going to be a bad ozone day. So again, we're going to see that, that later on you'll, you'll see some data that shows that's really bad. If you want to make NOx, that's how I would tell you to do it. And obviously they don't. Last one is fuel composition. Fuels that burn hotter make more NOx. So hydrogen, which is good in the aspect that when you burn hydrogen, it reacts with oxygen to make water, that's good. But the problem with hydrogen is it burns hotter than most other fuels. And when you've got nitrogen in that air, it's going to make more NOx. Now again, this is something that we usually don't control. We're usually stuck with whatever the fuel is. It's normally too expensive to treat the fuel, to take things out, or to put other things in. So we just have to deal with it. But again, that's important for us to know as designers, what is your fuel made out of? So we can figure out how much NOx are you likely to make. So of these, two and three, you have some control over. One and two, really not too much, if at all. All right, so those are some common parameters. This is a theoretical plot of the predicted NOx in parts per million by volume on a dry basis. So that's what PPMVD means. And this is the gas temperature for three different fuels, hydrogen, methane, and propane. The ending point for each curve is the adiabatic flame temperature for that fuel. So hydrogen has a high adiabatic flame temperature, so it goes up the highest. Methane, not as much, and propane kind of in between. You can think of this as the flame temperature, and what this shows you is the Zeldovich mechanism. The NOx goes up exponentially. It doesn't go up in a straight line. We'd love it if it went up in a straight line, but unfortunately it doesn't. So what that means is, as the temperature goes up, the NOx keeps going up faster and faster. So that means temperature control is really important. For example, in a flame, the thing we try to do is to eliminate hot spots in the flame. We try to make the flame temperature as uniform as we can because those hot spots can be killers for NOx. So again, this, the important thing to notice here is temperature exponential dependence. We can also look at stoichiometry. So 0% would be stoichiometric. That means you have exactly the right amount of fuel and oxidizer. To the left, we're fuel rich. To the right, we're fuel lean. Not enough air to the left, extra air on the right. Now, why the shape of this curve? Well, first of all, where would we want to run? A well-run system, I told you, is roughly 2 to 3% excess O2. That is equivalent to 10 to 15 percent excess air. How's that for NOx? That's the worst place you can be. So where we want to run is the worst place to be for NOx. So first let's look at the edges and then see why is it so bad right there. Well, on the left side, when you don't give your fuel enough air, you're not burning all the fuel. And of course it's not as hot because you're not giving enough air. Also, when you don't give it enough oxygen, hydrogen is the most reactive, so it takes its oxygen first. Carbon's the next reactive, it gets its oxygen second. Nitrogen's last. It's not very conducive to taking the oxygen, so we make very little here, but of course we don't want to run there because we're not burning all the fuel, we're not very efficient. How about on this side? Why is the NOx low on this side? Well, when you add all that extra air, you cool down the flame. Nothing magical there. Cooler flame, less NOx, but again, we don't want double the amount of air because all that air is sucking up heat and taking the heat out the stack. So what happens here is that now we've burned all the fuel and we have some extra oxygen. So we have a really hot flame and some extra oxygen. Eventually, when we keep adding more and more air, we cool the flame down. So right there is the worst place, and that's where we want to run. So what do we do? Well, we generally speaking try to run part of the flame fuel rich and part of the flame fuel lean. So the average is here, but we try not to have any part of the flame exactly at that ratio because, again, that's going to be the worst, which means that the design is pretty important. It's pretty critical to make sure we don't do that. 
So the mixing is one of the most important things now for making sure we don't make too much NOx. Excess air or excess O2 on NOx. So this is a curve that's in the American Petroleum Institute standard 535. And the point of this is that they have a generic curve in their standard, but real burners could be worse than that or better than that. So the main point here is be careful about using a generic curve because it is very dependent on the conditions and the kind of burner that you have. So again, just be careful. It could be worse than that or it could even be better than that. Air preheat. Again, this is a theoretical curve, so we're using an e equilibrium calculation. This is the predicted nitric oxide, again, parts per million by volume on a dry basis for three fuels, hydrogen, methane, and propane. And now on the bottom is the air preheat temperature. So ambient would be on the left-hand side, heated up to as much as 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the right-hand side. And you can see that the NOx goes up almost a straight line, a little bit faster than a straight line. Rough rule of thumb for about every 500 degrees of air preheat, you approximately double the NOx. So I told you that the reason why people usually preheat the air is to improve their efficiency. Well, when you improve your, improve your efficiency, you don't have to fire as hard. So the question is, does that offset how much you increase the NOx? The answer is no, it doesn't. In the glass industry, they preheat their air to 2,000 degrees. Now, why do they do that? Because they need a really hot flame to melt sand to make glass. So they're not doing it for efficiency. They're doing it because they need a hot flame. They have an alternative. They could use pure oxygen. Again, it's cheaper to preheat the air than to buy pure oxygen. But if you want to make NOx, again, that's what I would tell you to do. Preheat your air. So in the glass industry, they have a hard problem. In our industry, it's more common to preheat to maybe six, eight, a thousand degrees. And what sometimes people will do in our industry is if they're close to their permit limit, they might back off on their air preheat, and they can do that. I told you there's a company in, in Louisiana that does that when the government asks them to do that. So we do have some control over this. Obviously, they're not going to get quite the efficiency they got before, but it has a huge impact on NOx. So air preheat, very bad for NOx, good for efficiency, but the, that efficiency gain doesn't offset how much you increase the NOx. Hydrogen effects. I told you that hydrogen burns hotter than many other fuels. So this is a combination of hydrogen and methane. So at the very left-hand side, it's 0% hydrogen and all methane. On the right-hand side, it's no methane and all hydrogen. And you can see what happens. Again, this is a flame temperature effect. The more hydrogen, hotter the flame, the more NOx you make. You may recall when President Bush was in office, he talked about a hydrogen economy because when you burn hydrogen, you make water, right? Sounds good. Except that when you burn it with air, that air has nitrogen in it, and now we have to worry about a different pollutant, NOx. If you burned pure hydrogen and pure oxygen, then you wouldn't have to worry about NOx, but of course you got to pay for that pure oxygen. So that's some of the, the things that we wrestle with. Nitrogen effects on NOx. Well, this one might be counterintuitive. We're adding nitrogen to the fuel, and the NOx is going down. Well, wait a minute. Isn't nitrogen part of making NOx? The answer is yes, except that we already have plenty of nitrogen with the air. We have more than enough. It's not very efficient. It doesn't re not much of that nitrogen reacts to make NOx. So what's happening here is when we add nitrogen to methane, for example, we cool the flame down, and that produces NOx. I'm not suggesting that people should add nitrogen to their fuel, but when they have inerts, and it doesn't have to be nitrogen, it could be CO2, it could be any other inert, and some fuels have a lot of inerts in them, they're usually going to be better for NOx. So we talked earlier in the course about when you have certain fuels like a PSA gas that often has a lot of CO2 in it. 
That's really good for NOx. It's actually, though, bad for stability. When you have all that CO2, it absorbs heat. You probably know there are CO2 fire extinguishers that put out flames, right? So good for NOx, cools the flame down. But if there's enough of it in there, you may have flame stability issues. So again, the, the magic here is it's cooling down the flame. So it's not the fact that it's nitrogen. It's really anything. And an example that people use in industry that they will put into the flame is water. So they'll spray either liquid water or steam into the flame. Now, hmm, why? Again, cooler than the flame, cools the flame down. And you could sort of use it like a tweaking knob. So let's say we're close to our permit limit. We don't want to spend a whole lot of money on new equipment. Let's just spray some water into the flame. And that works nicely. It's not good for efficiency, though, because that water absorbs heat. It gives off some of the heat but it takes some of the heat out with it. So not good for efficiency, but it is good for NOx, which again is why people just spraying as much as they need to to get their NOx level low, low enough, but you don't want to put too much in. And obviously if you put a lot of the water in there, you'll put the flame out. So you only want to put enough in there to keep it low. And sometimes plants have excess steam capacity, so it's not so bad. But if you have to generate new steam for this, then obviously that's another cost. So those factors go in there. For liquid fuels, we talked a little bit earlier about organically bound nitrogen that could be in the fuel. And what this is saying is that the more nitrogen that's organically bound in the fuel, the more NOx you make. So this is how much NOx you make on parts per million basis. And this is just saying what's the conversion efficiency. You'll see that the conversion efficiency of that nitrogen goes down. But it's pretty high to start out with as opposed to the nitrogen in the form of N2 that could be in an air fuel flame, that conversion efficiency is a fractions of, a, of 1%. It's very small. This is pretty high. We did some experiments many years ago where we artificially put in a nitrogen-containing compound. It's called pyridine, and it basically followed this same kind of curve. The more we put in there, the more we made. So this is really important when we have to make guarantees on a liquid fuel is what is your organically bound nitrogen content because you can see it's almost a linear line for that. Do we control this? Usually not. It's usually whatever the fuel has in it to begin with. So we just have to deal with it. We have technology that could take this out, but again, it's way too expensive to do that. So as engineers, we're always looking for the practical. It's not what can you do, it's what can you do that's economical that somebody's going to pay for. And in this case, again, some things that we could do, but at least today, they're not economical. Maybe someday they will, but at least today they're not. So we're sort of stuck with it, and we have to do what we can. In this case, if you did have a lot of organically bound nitrogen in your fuel, then probably the cheapest thing is to remove the NOx on the back end, some kind of post-treatment. Let's look briefly at NOx measurement and reporting. The most common way to measure NOx is with a probe where you put it in and you extract a sample. This is normally done in the stack. Normally the regulators want to know what are you sending out into the atmosphere. So we'll pull a little slipstream and we'll normally do what's called conditioning the sample, which usually means we clean it dry it, and cool it. That's because when it goes to the gas analyzers, they don't like hot samples, they don't like wet samples, and they don't like dirty samples. So we condition it, send it to the analyzer, which means that when we do that, we're measuring normally parts per million. Most of these analyzers are on a dry basis, sorry, on a, on a volume basis, and when you remove the moisture, then it would be a dry measurement. So for your homework, you're going to be asked to convert some of these on both a wet basis and a dry basis. But most of the time, they are by volume on a dry basis. So again, we condition the sample because these analyzers can't tolerate that kind of a sample. There are some other analyzers, not normally for NOx, but for things like oxygen and CO. You can put them in the stack, and they'll give you an immediate reading without pulling a sample, without conditioning it but not normally for NOx. So then, again, typically, 
I'd say at least 95% of the ones that I've seen make NOx measurements by volume on a dry basis. So that's how we measure it. Here's a picture of one of our analyzers. This is a typical way to do it. There's more than one method besides chemiluminescent, but this is argued by most people to be the most accurate. In our portable handheld ones, they use an electrochemical cell. They don't use a chemiluminescent. This chemiluminescent, then what it does is it reacts NOx with ozone. So it actually generates ozone inside the analyzer. And when you do that, when you react NOx with ozone, you generate light. And that light is proportional to how much NOx you have. There's actually also a catalyst in there that you can do a way to separate how much NO and how much NO2 you have. We found out the hard way that you're supposed to change that annually. We were doing some measurements. We had never changed it, and we had the analyzer for like 10 years. So we found out the hard way you got to do that otherwise, because we, we put a span gas through there, and we didn't get the right rating. But again, we can measure both NO and NO2. This, though, has to be a conditioned sample. It's only going to take a dry, clean, cool gas. It won't take something that's not been conditioned. So that's a pretty common way to do it. And again, the, the regulators usually want to know how much NO2 that you're making, so they don't really want the split. So when you measure NO, which is normally the biggest component, you have to do a calculation to convert that NO2 artificially to NO2 as if it already went into the atmosphere and did that. So when you report to most regulators, it's just the total NO2. So you take your NO, make it NO2, and then add whatever else you measure for actual NO2. So this is, again, a common method for measuring. One of the things that people did early on, before the regulators caught on to this, was they added extra air to their sample to reduce the concentration. You may have heard the expression, the solution to pollution is dilution. Okay, That's really cheating. Right? But they didn't know that at first until they caught on. And the way that they prevent people from doing that now is you have to report what excess O2 level you're doing to that. So you, if you do add a whole bunch of air, now your excess O2 level is going to be higher, and you'll do a correction as if it were at a certain level. 3% is one of the most common ones. And you're going to do that for your homework. Very easy calculation. So we want to make sure that when you measure your NOx, you have to measure also your excess O2. So you need to know both of those. And if it's at a different level than you're reporting, and it normally is, you're not, almost never going to get exactly 3%, then you'll have to make a correction, easy correction. But you do have to do that because, again, industry at the beginning, uses, we'll just add more air and we'll make our number lower, which, of course, they did, but they actually still had that NOx in there. Last thing we're going to talk about today, and we're going to spend most of our time on this, is we know that NOx is bad. It's normally regulated, at least at most places in the United States. So how do we minimize it? What can we do to minimize it? We looked at last time when Kirk was here four ways, four general ways of reducing pollution, pretreatment, process modification, combustion modification, and post-treatment. I'm going to give you some examples of all of those for NOx, but we're going to spend by far most of our time on combustion modification. What can we do to the burners to reduce NOx? So let's look at pretreatment examples. One way to reduce your pollution is to switch from a higher polluting fuel like oil to a lower polluting fuel like natural gas. In the U.S., we did this in a big way when the pollution emissions from firing oil just got to be too expensive to clean them up. So we did this probably 40, 50 years ago. An example, a more recent example today is switching from coal-fired power plants to natural gas-fired power plants. I frankly never thought in my lifetime I would see natural gas cheaper than coal. Never thought that would happen, and neither did any of the experts. If you did, you'd be filthy rich today. When you fire coal, that coal usually has organically bound nitrogen in it, just like liquids, 
and it makes more NOx. So the beauty of natural gas is it's cheaper and it's a lot cleaner. When you fire coal, you've got more NOx, you probably got more carbon monoxide, you probably got unburned hydrocarbons, you might have heavy metals, you might have some other nasty stuff. And the power plants have the equipment to take that out, but again, that's all at a cost. So this one is a good option today. If, you, if we would have talked about this 15, 20 years ago, I would have said this is an option, but it's not economical. But that's not true. Today it is economical, so we can do that. Not economical everywhere. In the U.S. it is, but in other countries not. But that's an option. Another thing that you could do is remove the nitrogen from the combustion air. If you're burning a fuel like natural gas, nat most natural gases have just a very small amount of nitrogen in them, usually less than a half a percent, very small amount. But of course, air has lots of nitrogen in it. It's almost, four, it's almost 80 percent, 79 percent by volume nitrogen. So if you take all the nitrogen out, or almost all of it out, you can get very low NOx. The company that I worked at before joining John Zink, that's what we did. We sold pure oxygen to people like glass melters who are making so much NOx it's, it's unreal. But again, they have to pay for that. And again, sometimes it pays, sometimes it doesn't. depends on the economics of a particular plant. So again, here, this is always an option. The question is, is it economical? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. In general, it's not economical for lower temperature applications like process heaters. We did an experiment, I guess it was about five years ago, and we had a consortium of major oil companies from around the world came to us and they wanted to know if we fired pure oxygen and both natural gas and a typical refinery fuel gas, can we do that? Is that feasible? Then they wanted to know without making any modifications to the burners. So we set up a pretty elaborate test. We did this test. We tried a so-called conventional burner and a, an ultra low NOx burner. And we showed that yes, technically you can do this. No modification of the burner. What we did was we took the pure oxygen, we blended in furnace gases with it, and we made a pseudo air. So the air for combustion was CO2, water, and nitrogen. Sorry, and oxygen. So CO2, water, and oxygen, no nitrogen, or, or almost none. We actually had a little bit of nitrogen that got sucked in at, at leaks that we couldn't quite find all those. We got really low NOx, like a couple of ppm. But of course, it came at a cost, that pure oxygen. However, that wasn't why they wanted to run this test. They wanted to run this test so that if they ever have to recover CO2, they wanted to know, is this an option? If you have an exhaust stream that has just CO2 and water in it, you condense out the water, and now you have just CO2. And now it's easy to concentrate the CO2 because it's basically all CO2. The question is, what would they do with all that CO2? And that's not an answer we have, anybody has yet that I've seen. But what they wanted to know is if their governments came to them tomorrow and said, you guys got to start capturing your CO2. They wanted to know, is this an option? And the answer is, yes, it is. Is it economical? No, at least not today. Do governments always care if it's economical? Not always. So it is an option. It does make low NOx. That wasn't why they did it. They did it for CO2 capture. So that is an option, but usually not economical, at least not for lower temperature. You could also remove the nitrogen from the fuel gas. We have the technology to do that, usually not economical. So we can do it, but usually not cost effective. So that's pretreatment. What about process modifications? One of the best things you can do for any combustion process you have is to make it as efficient as you can. Because when it's less efficient, you have to burn more fuel. So I'll give you an example from the glass industry. When you go to a flat glass plant that's making windows for, or glass for windows and, and cars and buildings and things like that, a well-run glass plant, you will hear very little glass breaking. 
a poorly run glass plant, they're breaking glass all the time. They'll have a sheet of glass come out. They have an optical scanner that goes back and forth. It's looking for defects in the glass. They call them seeds. They're bubbles. And they're dangerous. They can explode. So they're looking for those, and if they find them, that glass is not acceptable, so they literally take a hammer, break that, they generate broken glass, they call that cullet, and they feed it back in the front, and it goes through again. The more they're doing that, the more their energy they're spending, right? So this one doesn't have anything to do with the combustion process per se. It just means make it as efficient as you can. In our industry, in the petrochemical industry, our guys do a pretty good job of capturing as much energy as they can. Really, probably the best industry that I've ever seen. They really integrate everything. They capture as much energy as they reasonably can. But some other industries, not so good on this one. So the better you can do, less fuel you fire, the less pollution you make. So that, that's an obvious one. Another one is to switch from fossil fuels to electricity. And if you think of an electric car, that's basically what we're doing. So what's the, the cost for that? Well, today, at least before, when the last time I checked this, the cost of electricity for, for heating was about five times as much for natural gas. It's probably worse today. That was when natural gas was more expensive than it is today. Natural gas is pretty cheap today. So it's probably at least five times the cost. What this also does is now it moves the problem. You still got to generate the electricity, right? But now we move it to the power plant, we take it out of our plant, we move it to the power plant. Now, there's an argument that, okay, they're better equipped to handle it because they have a much bigger scale. But again, you still got the problem that you're making some somewhere. So this one, you, you should analyze it overall. That's not usually what happens. Usually the plant doesn't care about the fact that they moved it somewhere else but we, we, we're still making it, just not at our plant, and that's, that's all they're worried about. So this is an option, but it's not usually economical. In fact, in some metal processes, when you go, they're trying to go from electricity to net fossil fuels the other way, because again, this is so <laughs> expensive. Okay, so those are two examples. We're gonna spend most of our time on combustion modification. What could we do to the burners to make less NOx. And here's some general things we're going to talk about. Staging, which means not putting all the fuel and air in at the beginning of the flame, but instead spreading it out and mixing it in a different way. Dilution, where we blend something into the flame to reduce its temperature and reduce the NOx. Ultra lean premix, we run part of the flame near the lower flammability limit. We put as much air as we can without putting the flame out. And then the last one is some next generation technology, some of which we're doing today, some of which we're not. Some of them are pretty cool. The problem or the challenge is when you go into industry, when you try to get your customers to try something new, yeah, that sounds great. Let me know after 15 or 20 people have done it and then, then we'll do it. But we don't want to be the guinea pigs. We don't want to be the first one to do it. So interesting technology, but unless there's some incentive, they usually don't want to be the first one to do it, unless there's an overwhelming benefit and very low risk. Sometimes what happens today is the government will incentivize people to try stuff. So there's something called a consent decree. I think the Flare guys will talk more about that. But that's basically where the EPA works with the company to figure out how you're going to meet your regulations. And it's kind of some horse trading. What can you do for us and what can we do for you? So an example for this is there's a plant in Pittsburgh, Kansas, so not too far from us, a couple hours from us, north of us. And they're trying a new technology that is getting, as far as I know, the lowest NOx in maybe in the world without any post-treatment. But they're the only ones that have done it. They've been doing it for three years, and they haven't done it on anything other than one small heater that if that heater were to fail, it wouldn't really hurt the production. So they've demonstrated this thing works. They've been doing it for three years, and yet nobody else that I know of has tried it yet. So that's frustrating when you have a really good technology and you just can't get the first few people to try it. Again, once they do, then especially when a competitor tries it and it works, 
then you can go and say, hey, you know your competitor's doing this and they're saving money. Then they'll do it. But until a few people try it, then, then that's tough. All right, so staging, if we've got our normal flame, we've got a hot spot in the flame. So shorter, compact, more intense, hotter. If we just merely stretch the flame out, it's releasing heat all the way along, and we can reduce the NOx. Just doing this doesn't reduce the NOx a whole lot, but it does. But there's some things we can do to make it even more of a reduction. What we can do then is stage either the air or the fuel or even both. It's a little less common to do both of them, but we usually stage one or the other. So this one, we've got all of the air coming in at the beginning of the flame, and we've got a short, intense flame. For this one, we put some air at the beginning of the flame, and then we add the rest of the flame downstream. We call this the primary air because it's the primary flame zone. This extra air is the secondary. And we don't normally actually have injectors that are out this far. It'll be normally an injector here that's angled in such a way that it'll delay bringing the air in. So that's a cartoon for staging the air. Here's another way of looking at it. All the fuel is coming through the middle. We put a little bit of the air in the beginning. Normally just enough to make it stable. So we want to be above the upper flammable limit to make sure, sorry, below the upper flammable limit so that it'll burn. And then we add the rest of the air downstream. And of course, you could do this as many times as you want. So we have a primary flame zone and a secondary flame zone. And that reduces the hot spots in the flame and makes a significant reduction in NOx. Here's an example of one of those kinds of burners. This one is actually a combination burner. We'll talk more about that later in the course. This one has the capability of firing oil or gas. So this is the main gas, is the pilot gas for the, the pilot. They're not supposed to fire both fuels at the same time. Some of our customers do that. They're supposed to fire either oil or gas. But the key is we've got a primary air, we've got a secondary air inlet, and the, you might even have a third air inlet. So again, we're not mixing the air right away. We're stretching it out, and we can significantly reduce NOx. And I'll show you some numbers in a minute. Here's an example. We bought a company in the UK, and this is one of their products. In our industry, it's a little less common to stage the air because usually these are natural draft, which means there are no fans on them. Again, we'll talk more about that later on when we get to burners. But if you do have a fan, then you have the capability of, of stretching or sp spreading out the air a little bit more easily. It's not as easy when it's just natural draft. So ideally, what you like is a flame that's bluer in color and very uniform. So this one's not quite as good as we can get. You'll see flames later on they are going to be more blue in color. And blue means cooler. <coughs> we can do just the opposite. We can stage the fuel. And that's probably more common in our industry because the fuel pressure in our industry is pretty decent. Air pressure usually isn't. In other industries, it's just the opposite. The fuel pressure is usually pretty low in some industries, and the air pressure is higher. <coughs> so here we put the primary air in the beginning, and then we add the rest of the fuel downstream. And you can see what we're trying to show is a cooler overall flame. And so here's the similar cartoon. We've just reversed it. Instead of the fuel going through the middle, now we have the air through the middle. We put just enough fuel so that it's stable. So we have to be above the lower flammable limit. And then we add the rest of the fuel downstream. And this is used in almost every one of our burners today in some form or another, but not only by itself. So we're going to add other things too, which we'll see in a minute. Here's an example of a staged fuel burner. In fact, the name of this burner is SFG for staged fuel uh, burner. Staged fuel gas is what the G stands for. So here we have the air coming in and the air is going through the throat, which is this orange part. The fuel is supplied back here. This is the pilot to ignite the main flame. Some of the fuel is going through the primary zone and the rest of the fuel 
is going through these side injectors that are actually buried in the ceramic tile. One of the ways you can tell how old the technology is, in, the, in our industry at least, is where are the fuel injectors. If it's really old, the fuel injectors are completely inside the tile. If it's a relatively older low NOx technology, it would be one like this, where the fuel injectors are actually in the tile. And today, the most modern ones, the fuel injectors are outside the tile, and you'll see some of those in a minute. So how well does this do? Well, a conventional burner makes roughly on the order of 100 parts per million, and you'll notice that as the excess O2 goes up, the NOx goes up, not wildly, but it does go up. Again, we try to tell our customers, on a well-run system, you should be around 2 to 3 percent. You should not be 4 or 5. If they went even more, eventually this is going to start to come down because they're cooling the flame off. But of course, that's bad for efficiency. You're heating up all that extra. Staged air was common right after the Clean Air Act was passed in the United States in 1970. At that time, people were firing mostly oil. Oil is more difficult to fire. You didn't want to stage the oil because it's already hard enough to fire as it is. You didn't want to have extra injectors. So most folks at that time did staged air. Then eventually people switched away from oil to gaseous fuels. Those gaseous fuels were at decent pressure. And so then people switched to stage fuel. And again, today, this is used in almost every low NOx burner in our industry, at least. Pretty good reduction. So we went from 100 down to 60, down to on the order of 30. Pretty good. But of course, the regulations continue to get lower. So now we have to do something else. Next thing is dilution, adding something to the flame to cool it down and to make it more homogeneous to get rid of hot spots in the flame. You could inject an inert gas, either in the fuel or the air. You could inject something directly into the fuel. We talked about injecting steam, for example. Some kind of dilution. Flue gas recirculation. This is a common technique used in boilers. What they do is they take exhaust gases off the stack and they pump them back around through the burner. Now at first you might say, well, wait a minute, aren't those hot gases? And didn't he say hot gases are bad for NOx? I did say that. But these gases are still cooler than the flame. Yes, they are hot to us, no question but they're cooler than the flame. They came out of the flame. They released their heat and came out of the flame. What they really do is make the flame more homogeneous to get rid of those hot spots. However, the problem with doing it this way is you have to have another fan to suck it and pull it around. You have to have duct work. It's got to be insulated duct work so people don't get hurt. You got to make the burner bigger because now you're adding an extra gas in there. And you may have to modify things in the burner that can handle higher temperatures which you didn't have to do before because normally the air and fuel are at low temperature. So does this work? Yes, but it's not the best way to do this. There's a better way. The better way is a technology that we call Infernox, in-furnace NOx reduction. We take those hot gases inside the furnace and we suck them back into the flame. We create a recirculation and the way we do that is with high velocity fuel injection. These jets are coming out at Mach 1, choked flow. So those high velocity jets create a suction, pulling gases with them. Again, these are hot gases, but not hot to the flame. They're hot to us for sure, but not hot to the flame. Again, they take some of the hot spots out of the flame. They make it more homogeneous. No reduction in efficiency. And let me just say for the moment that any technology that would, would reduce efficiency would be a hard sell to our customers. So if we came up today and said, you know, we can reduce your NOx by 50%, of course, you're going to lose production. You're going to say, no, we're not going to do that, at least most of them. So whatever we do can't reduce production. Here's an example of an early burner of this type. 
You can see that high velocity jets, these nozzles are outside the burner. High velocity jets suck in gas, furnace gases into the flame. Here's some testing that we did. Reasonably hot furnace. Fuel is natural gas. You can see again the effect of excess O2, and we got some NOx that was single digit. Now, would we get this in the field with this? No. In the field, it would be higher than that. But it shows the potential, pretty low. So that's good. Again, a way you can tell just by looking at the flame if this is an ultra low NOx burner or not is how uniform and how close to blue is it. This is a nice flame, very uniform and lower in temperature. Not lower in efficiency, just lower in overall temperature, in average. No hot spots in the flame. So that's what we're trying to create. Now, are these burners more complicated? Yes, they are. You can see lots of injectors. We're injecting a small amount of fuel through the tile into the primary zone on the order of 10%. Again, enough to keep it lit, but no more than that. We want it to be safe but no more than we have to. The rest of it is being injected up along the outside. Again, you get a nice uniform flame. However, one of the problems with this is, first of all, the burner is a little bit bigger because now the injectors are outside. It makes it a little bit harder to retrofit it into an existing hole. And secondly, the flames get longer. We can't just keep making them as long as we want because there's normally a convection section at the top. We can't impinge these flames on that because, again, that's going to cause damage. So that's one of the things we've wrestled with, and we now have some technologies that don't stretch the flame out as much as the initial ones did. Here's a variety of embodiments for this. Sometimes we fire up against the wall. Sometimes we fire in the middle of the floor. This is a rectangular burner. This is a rectangular burner. This is a round one. So lots of a variety how we do that. And again, this principle is in basically every ultra low NOx burner today, but not the only thing. So that works nicely. And did that further reduce NOx? The answer is yes. And by the way, this is really Infernox plus stage fuel. It's not Infernox by itself. So incrementally, we've gone down maybe another 10%. All of them, though, still, the more excess O2 you have, the more NOx, but not wildly more. Pretty good, but again, regulations still keep going down. Until this is zero, then we're done. But we're not done until it's zero, which is sort of good for us, right? It keeps us occupied. Now some next generation things. Some of these are being used to an extent. Some of them are not. Flameless combustion. This one's a fascinating one to me. The most extreme embodiment of this is where you have the fuel coming in one side and the combustion air coming in the other side. This is a recipe for a bomb, right? So you can only do this when the combustion chamber is above the auto ignition temperature. Then it'll burn. But when you first start up at ambient conditions, you got a bomb. So that's one of the things that obviously industry is not too wild about. What that means is you have to have another set of burners or another way to heat the furnace up until you switch to the flameless mode. And I'm going to show you a way that you can do that. So the key is, and now why does it make such low knocks? And why is it called flameless? When you do that, it's basically burning everywhere in the chamber, and our eyes don't see the flame. And I'm going to show you a video where the flame disappears. doesn't mean there's no flame. just means our human eyes can't see it. And by the way, even optical scanners have a hard time seeing that flame, which is another thing the industry doesn't like harder to detect that flame. But it's burning everywhere and you get really low knocks, like single digits. The other good thing about this is you get very uniform heating. I think in our industry that's a bigger benefit. If they don't have to shut down as often to decoke their tubes, that's a bigger benefit besides the low knocks. But again, we've got some issues. There's only one of these that I know of that's running commercially today. The one in, it's a couple hours from here. So people are interested in this, but man, this is pretty radical. All right, so this is the radical embodiment. What about something that's not quite so radical? Well, 
Again, hard to operate at low temperatures. You really have to have it above auto ignition, very low NOx. So here's one that's not quite so radical. We don't have the air and the fuel together in the same burner, but they're only spread apart a little bit. This one you could run reasonably, heat up the furnace without as much concern. Still be concerned about, but as much concern about blowing it up. For some reason, customers don't want to blow up their heaters. I don't know why, but they just don't want to do that. So we discovered a technology by accident that employs this technique. We bought a company from Germany. They make this burner for incineration applications. They don't have a very good test facility. We have a much better test facility. So what we did was we brought this burner to the United States to test it here in Tulsa in our facility. So our engineers and operators were, were working on this. So here's the burner here. Here's the, the exhaust end, so the stack's going up here. There's a camera looking right down the throat, and that's this thing right here. So this is actually three videos. I'm going to play this in a minute. There are three videos. This is one video which is showing data. This is a video showing the flame itself, so the camera looking down the throat. And the outside one is, it's frankly these guys walk around. They're not doing anything just for show. What happened was, one day they were running the test and they were shutting down for the day. They came through a condition where the analyzer said almost zero NOx. And their first reaction was, that's wrong. It can't be that low. So they recalibrated the analyzer, did it again, still got almost zero. They did it over and over. They didn't believe it. And we eventually patented this. And we discovered it by accident. No theory to base this on. And again, our guys, our engineers didn't believe it. Now it can't be that low. So what I've done here is I've chopped it out so that we don't have to watch. It's like, I think it took like 15 or 20 minutes. This is only going to be a couple minutes. It started out at 32 ppm and 1800 degrees. It ended at less than 1 ppm and a higher temperature. What I want you to focus on first is this video you're going to see the flame go away. It's going to disappear. Our human eyes won't see it. And your first reaction might be, ah, they lost the flame. It's cooled down, right? No, it actually is hotter. Oh, well, you're probably making a lot of carbon monoxide, right? No, not making a lot of carbon monoxide because that's going to be basically zero. Another thing about this technology that was really unnerving to our engineers was it was really quiet. They kept thinking the flame was out. And again, they couldn't see it either. So we got a camera, we can't see it, we can't hear it. And again, that was very unnerving to them. But they could measure that it was still hot and it was very low NOx. So again, focus on the flame. basically gone. You'll see at one point where the data will jump. That's where I cut out a big section just so we don't have to stand here watching for so long. Again, these guys aren't really doing anything. It's just for show. They're just walking around. But watch the data. It keeps going down and down. All right, so I think you get the picture. So again, we discovered this by accident, but we have not been able to commercialize it. We have tried all kinds of ways, conventional ways, to see that flame with flame scanners. We've had the flame scanner people come in, can't see that flame. So what we've had to do is use thermocouples, which we don't like. Thermocouples don't react fast enough. If you lose the flame, you want to shut it off right away. Thermocouples don't do that. So we have not been able to get customers to try this yet. Again, it's got great potential, but nobody wants to be the first one. And I understand that. I get that. If I'm an engineer in a plant, I get that. You don't want to stick your neck out. You, the joke was we've got to find a guy that's about ready to retire. So if he gets fired, not a big deal, right? But a young engineer, man, you could make a name for yourself, good or bad, right? If it works, cool. If it doesn't work, you could be blackballed. So that's the problem. Here's another technology. This is also a patented technology. 
What we are looking at here is we're looking up from the floor of an ethylene furnace. We're looking up the wall. These are what are called radium wall burners. We'll talk more about those later. And what we've done is put a significant amount of the fuel in this separate injector. So these are all real burners, but we've taken some of their fuel and put it in, in a bunch of injectors at the bottom, so it's injecting up. And this one is employed now. It's not so radical. I think we have a few dozen of these out there. So people are doing this, and it's working. But not, again, nearly the levels, not as low levels as the previous one. Here's another one, ultra lean premix. So in this case, we're putting all of the air and a very small amount of fuel in the main zone and then adding the rest of the fuel downstream. This is also commercialized technology. I'm going to show you later on some, some, exact, or some actual data from that. And you can see in our test heater, pretty low, and this is a hotter furnace. And we said before, temperature is usually bad for that NOx. We had a customer, and I can say the name of the customer because we've published this data. The customer came to us, and they, they're in California. They're in Richmond, California, right north of San Francisco. And this was probably about 15 years ago or so. And they had to significantly reduce their NOx by like 90%. That's a big number. So the, the option at that time was to put a post-treatment system in. Very expensive, takes up a lot of room. I'm going to talk more about that at the end. Or could they get, find a new burner to make this, to, for them to meet their emissions limit? So they came to us and they said, hey, let's work together, see if we can come up with something that works better. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm one step ahead of myself. So. Um, hold that for a minute. This is this, one of the things that we found out when we did single burner tests is that the NOx we measured in our test facility was a lot lower than we measured in the field. That didn't happen with the previous generations of burners because they were basically independent of each other. What we found out is the low NOx burners, there was a lot more interaction between the flames. So just to convince ourselves, we did a test in our test facility. We put 14 of these four rows of them in. They're little guys. They're about a million a piece, half a million to a million a piece, a million BTUs a piece. And we found out that, yes, if we did a single burner test, we got this. If we got the multi-burner test, which was the previous slide, and then if we took it in the field, we got considerably more. So now we had to factor that in when we make guarantees that we've got some interactions, which we didn't have with previous generations. Okay, so that was the point of that one. All right. Here's an example of these burners in an ethylene furnace, and that's commonly where they're used. So what we have here are rows of radiant wall burners. That's one style. This is another style. This one's fire, firing this way. The process is just out of this picture, and in this one you can barely see them. So these lines here are the, the radiant tubes. So what happens in this application is normally the flame comes straight out of the burner. But we can't do that here because the burner is only about three feet away. Sorry, the tubes are only about three feet away. If we blasted the flames out, we'd hit the tubes and we'd cause them to rupture. So instead, what happens is the flames come out perpendicularly. Instead, we're heating up the wall, and the wall radiates to the tubes. This is a really nice furnace. It's very uniform. This one, you can see, it's not quite as uniform. You got some striping, you got some hot spots, some cooler spots. Ideally, this would be perfectly the same color. This one's pretty good. And that's why they use so many of those little burners, is to try to make it as uniform as they can. But of course, the more of these you use, the more it costs. So the customer would rather use as few as possible, which again means it's harder to make it so uniform. But here's some, some examples. This one's called a cup burner. It's actually got an indentation in it. These are flush, so these don't have a, a cup refractory in there. All right, so this is the one that I started to tell you about. We had a customer, this is a heater in Richmond, California, Chevron, and they had high NOx. Pretty hot furnace, high production levels, and the state of California said you need to reduce that by about 90%. So again, a big number. 
They could buy a post-treatment system, very expensive, and has lots of other issues, which I'm going to talk about towards the end, or they can try to replace these burners with new ones that don't make so much NOx. In this case, this is a little bit unusual for how it fires, but the flames are firing across the floor, so these rectangular holes here, the burners inside of it, and the flames are coming out, going against the floor. There's actually a wall here that's just out of the picture, and there's another set of flames on the other side. So they're both firing against the short wall. It's, it's maybe only six, eight feet tall. That wall heats up and radiates to the tubes, and you can probably see the tubes there. So there's a set of tubes there, a set of tubes here. So again, very high NOx. And what we did with this customer is we said, all right, let's, let, we'll try this. Well, we got some ideas of what we might do. And the customer would fly to Tulsa about once every month or two. They'd look at what we did. we say, yeah, we like that. No, we don't like this. Change this. Fix that. And we went back and forth for about nine months until we finally came up with something that we're, everybody was happy with. So after it was done, we put two of them in their actual heater. I don't remember this particular heater. Some of them have as many as like 250 some burners in it. So the purpose of this test was not to see if it reduced the NOx. The purpose of this test was to make sure we didn't screw up something royally. The tricky part of this is they wanted to do it on the fly. Now we don't like to do that. That means this heater is at full power, full capacity, and we're going to pull a burner out while it's running and put another one in its place. Okay? Not wild about doing that, but in this case, it would have, they didn't have a, a shutdown scheduled for a while. And plus, they didn't want to replace them all anyway, right away, because they want to make sure one of them works, or in this case, two. So we made it a plug and play. We made it so it fits in the exact hole. The bolt patterns are exactly the same. So we could pull the old one out and put the new one in. Okay? So we did that, and everything was okay. No issues that we found. Everything fit correctly. So then we made it so we could do more of them. So here's a whole row of them that we replaced and saw a significant reduction in NOx. And I don't believe this was all of them in the particular heater. But you saw the numbers before, 150, 180, much higher than this. So these work pretty well. Here's an example of the before NOx, 180 ppm, and the after NOx, 15 ppm. A monstrous reduction. But there was another benefit that nobody expected. You can see the floor here is being overheated. That yellow is means it's hot. This one, you don't see that. And I told you before, we want as uniform a temperature in the flame as we can get. We don't want hot spots in the flame. Those are bad for NOx. What happened in addition to this is they could fire the heater harder. They increased their production without changing anything. We wish we would have known that because we would have charged them a lot more money. We honestly didn't know that. And does this happen every time? No. But in this case, they more than paid for the job by the increased production, and they would never tell us how much because they didn't want us to tell their competitors how much. Again, does this always happen? No, but in this case, because the flames are firing across the floor like that, they got it. So they got a, a monstrous reduction, and they could increase their production. So the, obviously, that would be the home run. That's what you'd love to be able to do. You've, you've improved the pollution, you've reduced the pollution dramatically, and you actually increase the production. Again, doesn't usually happen. But in this case, it did. And we've published on this. We've, we've written papers on it, although we don't know the, the increase in production. So they never told us. So we, we couldn't put that in the paper. And here's an example of these were big heaters. These are reformers, 228 burners in this case. And they have, I, I don't remember how many heaters they have, but they have multiple heaters in there. <coughs> so there's the conventional staged air, staged fuel internal flue gas plus staged, and then finally, ultra lean premix. I'm not putting on there the flameless because that's not been commercially accepted yet, but 
that would be even lower than that. So to me, this is one of the exciting things about working in this industry. Sometimes folks think, ah, combustion. Hey, we must know everything there is to know about combustion, right? It's been around since the caveman. The answer is no, we're still improving. We have a new technology that actually is commercialized. I haven't shown it here, but I think one of our guys is going to talk to you about it later. It's called smart combustion, and it's even lower than this. And it's, it, but it has not been implemented in, a, in an actual heater yet. So that's next. Last thing I want to talk about this is pre post-treatment. This is where you treated the gas after you've made the NOx, after you've made the pollution. It's a back-end treatment. It does work. This is called selective catalytic reduction. This is selective non-catalytic reduction. This is more effective, but it has some more issues to it. This is cheaper, but it doesn't work as well. You get about a 50% reduction here. You might get 90, 95% reduction here. In California, I'm told that every plant has these in it. What does it do? You, it injects a, a reagent, either ammonia or urea, into the exhaust. It reacts with the NOx in the presence of a catalyst in this case, and, and not in the presence of catalyst in this case, and it reduces the NOx. It's got to be within a certain temperature window, so it's got to be hot but not too hot. You've got to inject the, the reagent to make sure it mixes well, and again, this works now. And by the way, full disclosure, we sell this equipment. But I would tell our customers, don't buy this if you don't have to. Get low NOx burners, get the lowest NOx burners you can, because this is a whole lot more expensive and a whole lot more issues. So let me tell you some of them. This is a big piece of equipment. Most plants don't have a big chunk of real estate sitting there with nothing on it. So that's one thing. Another thing is, because it is so big and expensive, they'll usually pipe multiple heaters into it. If this thing goes down for some reason, you're in big trouble. You're going to be paying fines because as, compo as compared to a burner, if a burner, if one burner fails, you shut that off, you fix it, repair, repair, replace it. You don't shut down. You just keep marching along, right? This one, you either shut down or you're paying fines. It uses a, a reagent like ammonia or urea that are nasty. In some places, like California, they're trying to restrict the transport of those reagents around the state. You think it would be bad if you had a tanker truck full of ammonia in a residential area that had an accident? That would be bad, or a rail car or something big like that. And you are actually allowed to let a little bit of that come out the exhaust. They call that ammonia slip. You are allowed to let up to about 5 ppm of that slip out. Well, that's a pollutant, too. That also, if it's at the wrong temperature, can increase your NOx. This uses a catalyst, it has platinum in it. If you don't regenerate that catalyst, it's a hazardous waste. Again, it's expensive. It works. It does. But it's about an order of magnitude more expensive per ton of NOx reduced compared to ultra-low NOx burners. So don't tell my boss I've said this, but again, I would tell my customers, don't use this if you don't have to. If you have to, you have to, right? If you can't get low enough with the burners, you do this. But, and again, these both work. They're just expensive and they've got a bunch of other issues related to them. So here's low NOx burners. Here's an SCR. Again, about an order of magnitude difference. Talked about three kinds of NOx. Controlling temperature is the big deal, and here are some ways that we do that. There's an app you can download, and I will let you use this app to do your homework if you want to. I prefer you do it by hand, but if you can do that, I, you, I will accept that. But show me however you did it. If you use the app, tell me I use the app. And here's some other resources for more information. Questions? Everybody good? All right, so if you have any questions on the homework, obviously just let me know, and we'll see you next Tuesday.